Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversant is Reverend Bradley J. Hilgerson, Minister of the Word from the Church on the Square, which is a Texas-based congregation that keeps on getting hounded by the city council out in Georgetown in Texas. And in this conversation, we talk about trying to be the conscience for a world whose conscience is being twisted in a different direction than what the reverend believes is the correct and true path towards righteousness. Uh, Rather a religious conversation, which I know not everybody's into, especially in this day and age with everybody's moral compasses pointing this way and that way. But I found him to be a very open, honest, and kind-hearted man, and I enjoyed struggling with you know, the parameters of morality, again, in this day and age. You can find more of Minister Helgerson's work in the links below. And without further ado, here is Pastor Bradley. Is it reverend or pastor or priest? Or... It's not priest. It would be um, reverend, pastor, any one of those. It's fine. Okay. Um, you, you, you don't cling to the label? I don't. For meaning yeah. and purpose? Uh, well, I do think there is, um, something to be said for formality, right. Especially in an age when we throw them all aside, but, but, um, growing up, I eschewed all of that. And so it's, it's maybe just my own immaturity that I can't embrace, um, one of those titles more fully. So I usually just tell people to call me Brad or Bradley. So, yeah, yeah. I went to a college, uh, it's a very progressive college, and they had a, uh, I went later on in life when I was 36, and everybody called the professors by the first name. There's just something off about that, and I always yeah. called it professor, um, just because I wanted to establish that role between me as the student and them as the professor, uh, just yeah. to keep my my head in the game. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it, it's not necessarily a joke, but it's not reality, but it is for the sake of that transaction. Uh, I, I felt meaning yeah. in that, that they eschewed that. Well, it's similar to manners, right? It, manners can become legalistic. Um, they can become moral in a sense. But if you get rid of all manners, right, all politeness and everything, it really, uh, I guess it would be a sign that the society is falling apart, right? That we can't, we don't even have order in our personal interactions. So there isn't order then in the classroom and all that stuff. So order is good, but it obviously can be abused. Yeah. Like order on the border. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Is that something you're uh, thinking of weighing in on or? No, because you are in not. Texas, so it's kind yeah, of yeah. I uh, know we have we already seceded. I'm not sure if, <laughs> where we're at at the in the constitutional crisis. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, yeah, probably not. <laughs> yeah. Well, where is your calling? It, my dad was a pastor. Then he was a chaplain. Now he's retired. But um, there's this framework within Christianity about having a calling to mm-hmm. this position. Where did the mm-hmm. is that a framework that you're amenable to and I think so. Um, yeah, I would definitely say so because it's it's the kind of job that is so difficult to do if you do it right that if you don't feel called to do it, I think you won't last. So, um, you know, I certainly felt a calling to ministry even before I was converted. It's a strange story. I don't know if this is theologically sound or not, but um, when I was seeking and studying scripture, um, which was in my early 30s. I was converted at 33. Uh, I had this sense, like especially when I was standing at the threshold, right? When I was deciding whether I would surrender to it or not, I had this sense that it was sort of a package deal, that if I was going to become a Christian, that I was there was also going to be a call to ministry. So I had to be willing to to do both, um, which at the time I was totally ignorant of what that would mean, right? I think, okay, that seems fine. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it, you know, the cliche is the, the pastor only works on Sunday, right? 
it, it turns out, and I, as I said, I went into it not knowing, it's, it's such an incredibly difficult job. It's so taxing spiritually. It's difficult for your family. Um, if, if you didn't feel, if I didn't have a sense, I'll put it this way, I'll speak about myself. If I didn't have the sense that I had to do this, then I would do something else. Like if that sense were to leave me, if I felt God calling me to do something differently, I would go. I would go and do it without hesitation. And not because of my great piety necessarily, just because this job, if you do it right, if you do it wrong, it's probably the easiest job there ever was, right? It's a joke. Uh, but if you're gonna do it right, if you're gonna do it the hard way, it's, it's, a, it's almost unforgiving. I mean, it's a very, very uh, challenging job. So yeah, I believe in a calling. It's what keeps me in ministry now almost 15 years. And it, I would have to sense it in order to continue and to go on. Yeah. Could you give me a precise or a, kind of a summary of what doing it right entails? Oh, my goodness. Um <laughs> Well, I guess it would fit into several categories. Um, one is, as a pastor, the, the word essentially means shepherd, right? It's a transliteration of Latin. And to shepherd uh, a local congregation, a group of saints, is an enormous responsibility. Scripture says that you're going to give an account, the time of judgment, for the souls of these uh, people that you are shepherding. And when it comes to the teaching, Scripture also says, let many of us be teachers, we, we face a stricter judgment. So one piece of it is, is that the judge at judgment time, pastors, those who are faithful, will be lifted up and uh, be given special honor. Uh, but they will still have to go through a judgment where there will be a time of testing and they will face a stricter judgment. So... On the cosmic scale, you know, thinking about the, the uh, future, the stress of that is, you know, it's 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 unbearable, really, if it weren't for the grace of God and everything else that Scripture says about God's nature. Uh, but there is going to be a judgment, so that's a huge responsibility. I can't think of something else uh, that would be a, a bigger responsibility. Because um, even a president isn't isn't responsible for the souls of the nation in the same way that a shepherd of the local church would be. So that's a big part of it, that if you're going to do it right, you have to take upon yourself that responsibility and do everything that you can in your power and the opportunity that you have to shepherd the flock that you've been given. Um, the The other part of it that makes it so hard in order to do it right, you have to um, embrace this is that a lot of times the sheep act like goats. I mean, they act like goats a lot and they resist, they kick against the goats. They, um, you know, you can invest in them over many, many years, right. And really sacrifice for them. And they can just turn on a dime and uh, mm. try to ruin your reputation, try to destroy the, the congregation that you're working at. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, um, I mean, one way to think about it is if you read Scripture, read the New Testament, especially First and Second Corinthians, where Paul's, especially Second Corinthians, where he's lamenting on, in one level about all of the ways in which these churches that he's planted have mistreated him, right? And yet, he's now he's an apostle. So he's over. I can't imagine that being over many congregations. I mean, just one is so overwhelming to me. The thought of having to be over so many, I just I can't imagine it. But um, so the difficulty is, is captured there. The, the right, so the right way to do it is to embrace that responsibility, that calling, right, that vocation, and say, I'm going to give it everything that I have. I mean, even just getting in the pulpit to preach is frightening because, in a sense, you're standing in the place of, of Christ, right, in a sense, right, because you are opening up the word of God and, and proclaiming to the people what it means, um, expositing it, explaining the text, exhorting them to right living. 
So that in itself is a, is a tremendous responsibility, uh, something that no one is, is completely fit for. Um, so to do it right is to, to, to embrace that, that responsibility, to take it upon yourself and do the best that you can with God's help and the help of the Spirit. Um, doing it wrong would be, you know, you could still get up there and preach or whatever, but, you know, you, you're not investing in the lives of your sheep. You are, are um, you know, there's a way to create distance between you and your congregation, right? To sort of be hands off, uh, to yeah. put layers of bureaucracy maybe between you and them, to protect yourself, to, to have it be where your family is off limits, uh, and perhaps to move around from congregation to congregation instead of trying to stay in one place and really investing. Um, you know, I guess there's a thousand ways to do it wrong, but really it comes down to not taking upon yourself this responsibility. And it's, you know, ministry is one of those things from the outside you think, you know, people think, well, I'll, I'll, I'm going to give my money to this particular ministry. They're helping, you know, people in Africa who are starving. I spent about over a six year period, I spent a lot of time in Africa and you realize how complicated, <laughs> it's never straightforward, right? People are complex, sin complexifies everything, you know? Uh, and so it's always, uh, it's, it's in, in a lot of ways, it's ugly. The work that you do is ugly, but you, you know, you rejoice in the times in which it's, it's a success. It's such a depressing way to describe yeah. <laughs> my, my job. I, I appreciate you leading me into you know, I'm not the depressed. valley of I'm not despair. I, I'm not suicidal. <laughs> okay, you know there are there are huge upsides as well. When you have a win, right? There's nothing sweeter. But with every loss, um, yeah. is I mean you're there in a way to, you know, you're the person that stands up at their funeral. You're the person that stands up at their baptism. You're the one that stands up at their wedding. I mean, you're shepherding these people through their entire life. So there's a huge weight upon you to, uh, at least I feel a weight to be able to, in that moment, articulate, you know, the truth of what's taking place and who these people are and what they believe. Um, so it's, when it goes well, it's glorious. I mean, it's glorious to conduct a wedding and, you know, to, to glorify Christ and to, and to have this marriage be a symbol, as Paul says, of the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. You know, it's such an honor to stand in that place, but at the same time, it's, um, it carries with it such a huge responsibility and such a burden. Um, but, you know, if you think about it this way, too, is... It used to be that you lived in one community your whole life. There was one pastor. He, he pastored your one church, right, forever, all the way through your whole life. He, knew, he was pastoring generations of people. Now we live such atomized lives. You know, I'd be a pastor for someone. Like, my congregation is constantly in flux. People are moving. People are moving in. Uh, they're going. They're choosing a different congregation. You know, it's very consumeristic uh, in many yeah. ways. Um, and so... You know, it's like the sweetness that comes from being in one community and being sort of a pillar in that community and knowing generations, you know, and your your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren being all in the same church in that same community. A lot of the meaning and, and value and sweetness of it is because that's gone is lost, right? So now it's much more of a, you know, I have you now for five years, I'm going to pour into you everything I have, but then you're going to be gone, right? And I'll never see yeah. your children or your children's children. Uh, so yeah. there, I don't think we're, I don't think we're designed, we're designed to live in community and we're in this, yeah. where we are now, so many people, um, I think. Well, it's, what's your it denomination or lack of, it's thereof? Not, it's not, yeah. <laughs> It's non-denominational, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, because yeah. you could say that uh, you could parallel between uh, what you were saying about just the state of the world and also the state of the church. If there was one holy Catholic church still, then right. you you would all be, there would be, that. there's a lack of resonance in the faith as well because of the permutations 
that uh have gone on since i don't know which which break from the which church you want to trace it back to but yeah well i guess i'm protestant so i would i would try to defend the the break with protestantism but you're right it's um I sometimes I feel it's it's interesting. The last this last church building we've been worshiping in is a Methodist church. And so it was built, you know, over a hundred years ago. Um, so many other places what we've met are like in a theater and a guitar store, you know, the typical sort of yeah, non-denominational yeah, yeah. thing, which is cool. Oh, they're in a movie theater kind of good. The place doesn't, you know, if it's cool, that's what matters. That the aesthetic of it is um, you know, eclectic or cool or whatever. But um, but when you go into a more traditional worship space like that, where there's sort of, you know, it's a sanctuary, right. And it's, it's, it's built beautifully and it has stained glass windows and has all these things that are designed in order to help you connect with the transcendent. Um, you know, and then I'm up there with my, you know, untucked shirt and you know what I mean? Doing, doing my preaching thing, which is my preaching is pretty traditional, but, but still I feel out of place. You know, I feel like, huh. and I grew up Catholic, sort of a nominal Catholic. So maybe this is part of baggage from that. But I do feel like the church is sort of split and we're this sort of, you know, one of these synagogues out in the middle of nowhere, you know, huh. and there's this sort of remnant building left over and we're trying to do our thing. Uh, but it's not exactly the way it's supposed to be. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of like if you had to be congruent. Yeah, I, I think it's there's certain aspects of it that are missing. They're missing in the liturgy, even in in the the hierarchy of the church. Um, which are these are all non-Protestant things to say, you know, as a Protestant. But uh, because many good things did come out of Protestantism, and maybe it's a natural. It was it, it was something that had to happen in order for the church to evolve. But I do have a sense that when I look at a Catholic cathedral, like that's not exactly what I'm doing. Do you know what I mean? I feel like we're sort of on the outside. We're trying to cry for reform, but if reform did come, I'm not sure that I would have a place anymore. Do you know, my job would be done. Okay, good job. We're all back together. And now it would be something, something different. Do you know? Um, it's a weird, you know, it's a sort of dissociated sense that I have that yeah. this is that this is that and just think of in terms of cultural renewal influence of the church I mean we're scattered about so much we can't speak with one voice on anything um now of course the downside you know of a of one that's of a united church is that who's ever in leadership they go astray and the whole thing uh, goes down but there's certainly downsides to the other side where this more de uh, democratic view in which you know, each church yeah, speaks yeah. for itself and that's it. Do you, did you ever have a moment in your life where you allowed, were allowed to listen to Iron Maiden? This a British rock band. Do you remember them? Yeah. Oh yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. I, they have, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So you had a hard rock phase. They have this one song yeah. called the loneliness of the long distance runner. Um, it was just about, a guy who's trying to run a marathon and just how right. stressful and straining, straining that is. And that's kind of, it sounds like that's kind of what you're describing, describing just how lonely it is. And, and so I'm just thinking about it in a broader picture, like there's a trade-off with being non-denominational where you get to follow your conscience. I think you probably have mm -hmm. more wiggle room, but the support structure for you, uh, that that that's what you have to, I guess, sacrifice like the support structure, the hierarchical structure. You don't take any orders, so you get to you know run run the game as you see fit. But you, who has your back? Who holds you? Who shepherds you? Yeah, well, and it, it's imp almost impossible, perhaps, not to fall into a more consumeristic relationship with the flock, right? Because they're essentially in charge. I mean, we have an elder-run church, so it's not democratic like you'd have another. We're in the Baptistic tradition, but we run our church more similar to sort of an, if there was such a thing, an independent Presbyterian kind of church, that kind of church governance. So it's run by men who meet the qualifications that are laid out by Paul. Um, and, and yet it, it's still the way the, 
and this is probably true of the evangelical church broadly, <clears throat> and maybe Protestantism broadly, but it's so consumeristic, right? It's it's just that there's so many churches they could go to, so many alternatives. So at any point, the, the congregation can choose to go somewhere else. So there's this tendency to want to uh, lead in a way that you're not going to offend anyone. You're going to make everybody happy. So the whole sort of orientation is, you know, we want to have a church. And you see this when the churches are planted. You know, <clears throat> they'll send out these flyers, these mailers, and it looks like the cover of a fashion magazine, right? You know, the the pastor and his wife, they look like models. Your, ch- your kids are going to have so much fun. And, you know, it's, it's to make church as easy as possible, right? To make it as fun as possible, um, you know, to, to make it as, you know, not challenging, right? You want to come, relax, have coffee, hear an uplifting message. Your kids get to have fun. And, yeah. you know, and then come back next week. Um, so, um, boy, church, sorry, church as a, uh, church is like a Chuck E. Cheese or a cafe rather than the gym. Oh, yeah. So it's, that's right. So I'm going in and I'm looking at the same way I look, you know, as I'm looking for a gym, I'm, I'm looking gym membership. I'm looking to place membership at a church. So it, it can make it very difficult. You have to fight that as as someone who's leading a church, not to have that dictate what you do, right? How are people going to respond? You know, is this certain segment of our congregation, are they going to become offended? The question is, is it biblical? Is it right? If it is, we're going to explain why we're doing it and we're going to do it. Um, we're not going to hesitate. Um, and so, like you said, because there's no hierarchy, you know, whether or not I, I can make a living is dependent upon the members of my immediate congregation. So if they were all yeah. to leave, then my, yeah. you know, my, my living would be gone. It would disappear tomorrow. So, um, you know, it can feel like you're an entrepreneur. I mean, you can, there's all these other modes that we are so familiar with that you can fall into to try to make the a influencer. success. You the sound influencer. like a content creator, you know, audience yeah, audience capture. Ex- yeah. And you know, it's interesting. So many people have, have uh, not so many people, but people around me have said, you should, you should have your own YouTube channel. You should, you know, you should make this, what we're doing right now, a bigger feature because you can build a bigger audience, right? And you could be more independent, right? You don't have to be as dependent upon the congregation. You can, I mean, all these kinds of things that people would say. And I've resisted it all along because it seems to me, again, it's like, and, and I don't want to, if you want to have those things and do those things, obviously go for it. But for me, I feel like it's, I need to be dependent upon my congregation, right? Primarily. Okay. Yeah. Um, because they're the ones that I'm serving and that's the way the relationship is set up, how it's supposed to work in scripture. And so I mean, and which is, you could be bivocational too, because some churches are so small, they can't support a pastor at all. So I'm not saying that that's yeah. wrong either, but, but the, the, the pull towards a consumeristic model, as we can see by, so many churches that are out there is strong and I don't know how to fight against it completely. I don't know how to get rid of it completely because as we were saying, you know, like that's sort of how we are oriented to the world. So it's like, it's not a shock that we would be oriented towards the church in that way. What does that say about our relationships? And then, uh, like the, yeah. What, what, what impact does that have on relationships? Isn't that profound? So, um, yeah. Much easier to so, yeah. reduce relationships into interests or into overlapping interests. Uh, the deep bonds of kinship are uh, cheapened because you could just swap it out. Everybody becomes Legos. Society itself right. becomes, I guess, the atomization is the the word. Yeah. And I think that just to, our desire for that kind of atomization that kind of um, isolation even is sort of the deep rooted narcissism that we all have, right? We, we don't want to be dependent on other people. We don't want other people to depend on us. We don't want to have that kind of responsibility. 
So it's a strange thing. There's a desire for us to get away from that as much as possible to make our life easy in that way. and Really just have to look out for ourselves. But on the flip side of that, of course, meaning in life comes from that kind of responsibility and being in a community like that. So it just, it creates a very artificial community, right? It, it's where you have to sort of come up with things. If you, if, you're, if you realize that you need community in order to, to give your life deeper meaning, once you realize that, you then often engage in these sort of artificial ways of bringing people together just so that we can have community, right? It's, I've been thinking about this a lot lately in terms of sort of post-industrial revolution, right? Where before that, the household is sort of the basic economic unit rather than the individual, right? And every family has essentially a family business and it's extended family and even some workers around. And so it's the, the, the husband, the father of that family was to manage the household, right? He, would, he, was, he was an authority figure in the sense that it was his responsibility for the common good of that group. But also, of course, then every household would interact within a village and, and all of these things. Um, but your whole family worked together to produce whatever it is that you were producing to contribute to society. Like you, your purpose and your value were clear, right? You had, your life was rich in meaning because if you're the blacksmith, you know, your father was a blacksmith, your grandfather was a blacksmith, all this knowledge is passed down. It's this sort of generational knowledge and your whole family works together to fulfill that role in society, right? If, if you were to be eliminated, they'd have no more blacksmith, right? So you was, your purpose and value in society are natural to it, right? Um, now we live, uh, you know, the, so, so men now leave the house, they go out and work a job, or maybe they work from home, but they're highly specialized in what they do. There's no, there's no training of their family and the family business, right? Which would be a very natural way for families to function and for family relationships to be built. I mean, one thing, it's sort of scatterbrained, but um, huh. one thing I've noticed about men, uh, you know, especially professional men, men who, you know, who, some of them are captains in their industry, very successful men in business. Uh, they have ter strained relationships with their sons, you know, or even their all their children. Like they can't relate to their son. They, you know, they they don't have, you know, they're unable to communicate with them. They're not close with them, and yet. You know, at their funeral, there'll be 10 guys that will stand up that they mentored in business that, you know, will talk for hours about everything that this guy did for them and how he was a father figure to them. In other words, those are his sons yeah. because of the environment that he was in. He was training and mentoring these men in, the, in that family business, essentially. And his son, you know, there was no need for any of that. So his son was off doing other things and he'd come, you know, the dad would come home from work. He can't. He's trying to artificially like let's do sports or let's do something, you know, get into clubs or Boy Scouts or something to try to create an environment in which we can have this kind of relationship, in which we have a goal to work around right communities based upon, based around a goal. Um, and so we, we're living in a time when more and more, with greater and greater advances of technology, we're able to isolate ourselves more and more, and yet we're having this meaning crisis and. Uh, yeah. And so it's not surprising. Yeah. Um, how we were introduced is because of uh, an interaction between uh, your message and your environment. Uh, which I, it seems like if you want right. to lay out the controversy, but I want to explore also like what you're, we were kind of talking about your responsibility as the pastor within the church, but what's your responsibility uh, right. to the world outside of your church and how right. does, how does that message, um, introduce novel, uh, problems for you to solve? Yeah. Um, so one thing this, this sort of set the stage for that, my understanding in terms of the role of the church in the community, right? That God has established, um, certain institutions, the family, church, the state, and that one of the responsibilities of the church is to be the conscience of the state. So um, what that means, what that meant for me, and this was, I guess, coming up on maybe a year and a half ago now, our uh, sort of the, the mural incident, maybe we'll begin with the 
We weren't said, although I will say that our church was controversial from the beginning because we launched the church in the, at the beginning of the pandemic. We, um, we were planning to mar- launch a church uh, in March. We've been planning for about six months and then, you know, February, everything went crazy because it's 2020, right? February. And um, so we waited through March. And then as we got towards the end of April, we said, okay, we're going to, we're going to open um, because all the other churches were closed, right? They were all online, online worship, which is a whole nother feature of this, essentially what we've been talking about. Sure. The idea that you can have church through a screen and have community right through essentially social media alone. Um, yeah. So we were controversial to begin with. Um, we can talk about how, because I'm convinced if it wasn't for the pandemic, our church would not have been successful. We would have failed, um, failed to <laughs> launch. Um, and we can talk about why maybe, but the, so I think that, as I said, the church is to be the conscience of the state. So um, what happened was in Georgetown, where our church is, um, which I'm, tr- I'm struggling to know. So should I introduce sort of the city and all that a little bit to kind of give some more background? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, because people think Texas is just this gun totent uh, yeah. environment. Freedom but, uh, loving. A, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Freedom loving. Like we have an image of that, but like it's, it's you know, it's a modern American vista. Yeah, so, it is. But it's so got George- particularities. Georgetown is the county seat of Williamson County, which is gone to be fastest growing county in the United States. Georgetown itself over the, in the last three years has been the fastest growing city two times. And many of the cities within the county are also in the top 10. So it's exploding. It's the county just north of Travis County, which is where Austin is located. So it's a suburb of Austin. For the longest time, Georgetown though was remained pretty conservative. It was able to resist sort of the radical progressive um, uh, movement of Austin. They used to refer to Austin as the People's Republic of Austin. So the people yeah. from Georgetown, we call them. Um, Austin, Austin also had, for a long time, had this slogan of keep Austin weird. And Georgetown yeah. had a slogan of keep Georgetown normal. Um, <laughs> to give you a sense. So, but it's also, uh, as the county seat, it also tends to be the cult- a sort of cultural hub like the art scene is much more vibrant in, in Georgetown. We have a, a, a beautiful downtown square on the courthouse. So you have the county uh, employees. We also have Southwestern University, which is a Methodist uh, liberal arts, so-called uh, college at, you know, in the heart. And so it's, it's a strategic place. I would say a strategic place for the gospel. Clearly it's a strategic place for the sort of, identitarian, sexual identitarianism that's sweeping the land. Uh, So there's, in the last five or six years, maybe even longer, there's really been a battle uh, for the soul of this city. Now, in in terms of the city government, most of the people, of course, are very woke. Um, The people in the arts community, community of work, people who tend to be downtown um, are much more progressive in their thinking. And then the people in the suburbs are very much very much not. So what happened was, is the city, the Arts and Culture Board, which which is supposedly in charge of all the public art in Georgetown, decided, I guess, maybe five years ago, four years ago, decided to start painting murals. And I'm not a fan of murals. To me, they sort of look like you're putting a tattoo on a building, which I'm not a fan of, but <laughs> they decided to beautify Georgetown with these murals. And they decided on one wall, they would dedicate it or or allow students from Georgetown ISD to paint the murals. So the students would submit their plans. They'd have a contest and the winner could come and then have their mural painted. And it was the second mural that was actually painted. It came from Forbes Middle Middle School student. So this is the Arts and Culture Board, which is part of the city government, working with the Georgetown ISD. And they have a contest and this this student from Forbes Middle School wins and they paint the mural and it's, you know, there's, uh, it's a, a field of poppies. We're, we're called the red poppy capital of the world only because we've, I think, spread more poppy seeds than anyone else. But we have a big poppy festival once a year and 
So there's a field of poppies, red poppies, and then there's a cloud above it. And then in rainbow colors, the words be your own person. <laughs> but instead of the poppies being red, each of the poppies are painted in the colors of one of the pride flags. So the transgender flag, non-binary flag, also some middle school student. So she's probably 13 years old, right? So it's sponsored by the Arts and Culture Board. They paint it on the wall uh, and I see it at the time I lived downtown. So I called my, my um, city council then and made him aware of it. They were, they, the city council was not aware of it. And he asked me to come down to the city council meeting when they were gonna present all the murals and make a public comment. So in terms of being the conscience of the state, this was an opportunity to step forward and say, this is wrong. This, this should not be, this needs to be taken down. You know, maybe an investigation should be launched as to, you know, how this came about, right? So I went down and I spoke at the city council meeting. This was at the end of April. At the time we were renting the Palace Theater, which is a live theater in, uh, in the downtown area. We'd been there about a year and a half. So it was a Tuesday, I went down and spoke at the meeting. And then it was either that Friday or the next Friday, I got a notice from the theater saying that our, you know, our lease is terminated. Some sort of generic reason. What did reason, you like, say? What did I say at the meet at the uh, city council meeting? Yeah. What uh, offensive thing did you say? Well, essentially, I said, um, well, I spoke about the ideology. I said, this is not about, you know, one or two people who are, you know, it's just, it's not an effort to try to protect a few people as it's often framed, but this is an ideology that's seeking to unravel Western civilizations. That's essentially what I said. And <laughs> um, I mean, you can find the clip online and, and see what I said. I mean, I said it in a polite way, but I was essentially saying that, you know, and I take this from Philip Reeves, who was a 20th century sociologist, but that, you know, this, he breaks, breaks Western history into three worlds. The first world is the classical period, the Greeks and the Romans. The second world is um, Christendom, of course. And then the third world, and he uses that terminology advisedly, because you think of a third world country, right? He's trying to say this is a third world culture that's now taken over. But he says the difference with the, the culture we're in now is that it's not really a culture, it's an anti-culture. Right? It, it seeks to destroy particularly the culture that came before it, all the symbols and, and, and stories, um, all the culture of the Christian culture. So it's very iconoclastic. It seeks to, you know, to deconstruct for the sake of deconstructing. So yeah. Essentially, what I was saying is this LGBTQ plus movement, um, it's, it's not a movement of, of liberation. They are liberationists, right? Their purpose is to destroy, to tear down, um, to unravel the Christian culture, which is the Christian West. Um, so that was enough. Um, you know, that was, it was not well received. Um, and so, like I said, I think it was the next, that Friday or the next Friday, I got a notice saying your lease is terminated effective immediately. Sunday was Mother's Day, right? So it's Friday, Sunday's Mother's Day, right? So there's no place for us to meet. Um, we wouldn't be able to secure a location, obviously, over the weekend. So instead, we met on the, the lawn of the courthouse, right in, right in the downtown, and I invited every single church that I knew of to come and join us. I said, we've been kicked out of our place because I spoke at the city council meeting against this mural. Please come show solidarity uh, as we have our worship service outside. And one church did come. We had one other church that came. I had many people say, oh, we wish we could, but you know, we've got all these other activities going on, so we can't come. But one church did join us. And then we stayed there on the lawn for about three months. So we kept having church just on the lawn at, you know, at 11 o'clock in the middle of the town square for about three months. Um, and for several reasons, one was because no one would rent to us. We had sort of become this lightning rod, right? This, 
these troublemakers, even people who are more conservative, we look like, you know, we were, if they rented to us, there was going to be retaliation from a certain segment of the community. Um, and so we stayed on the lawn, like I said, for three months. And then the building is owned by Williamson County. Williamson County is also very progressive. And so they barred off all the grass for three months. They wouldn't let anyone go on the grass of the, um, of the courthouse for a long period of time. Later, I heard from someone more on the inside that they did that because they wanted us off the, off the square, right? We were just, it seemed to be there was a concerted effort within a certain community. There's really sort of culture shapers of, of our community, which is a small group of those city employees, those in the uh, arts and culture community. Uh, they wanted us off the square, right? They wanted to silence our church, to shut it down. And at that time, especially, people were not as bold. People are becoming more bold now because more people have stood up against this ideology. So there's a lot more people that are becoming bold. But at the time, nobody uh, wanted to be associated with us out of fear that they themselves would be canceled. So we went through a rough patch of time where we were meeting in a little guitar store of a friend of mine on the square it was too small. Our church grew rapidly from the, um, when we launched uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, we went from three families. So we had about 17 people total and seven or eight of those are my own family to uh, outgrowing the place where we were at very quickly. And then we grew to about a hundred people at, at the palace. So within you know a year and a half or something, we went from 17 to a hundred. So we were growing rapidly, but then all this trouble happened. We were back in this little shop on the square, which couldn't hold very many people. Um, and so we struggled for a long period of time for almost a year to try to find another location. We didn't want to move far away, right? We could move to a different city or move far away from the square. We wanted to stay on the square, um, because everybody wanted us to leave. So that really motivated us to want to stay. And then it sort of takes us into the next stage, which is that uh, finally a church uh, agreed to let us use their space. This was about seven months ago. And then that's the, the place that we've just gotten another eviction for because of the same issue. We were completely upfront with this church that we started renting, but um, you know, it, I guess too much negative attention, something like that drove them to change their mind. And the, that's still with uh, like reverberations of the bureau or were there new controversial counter I don't, cultural well, uh, statements that surfaced? I think it's, I don't know. I actually don't know that the reasons again, given to me are so generic and I know some people are on the inside, but I don't know whether the reports have been given are accurate or not. I think it's mostly that, you know, we had our first pride event in Georgetown, maybe four months ago, which was a big deal, right? We've seen this happen in communities around us. They have a first event, it's very small, right? And then it's sort of every year it builds before you know you have a parade and, and they're taking over uh, major events. And so um, I went to protest and really, and when I mean protest, what I mean mostly is evangelize to the people who are there and try to have conversations and speak to people um, in the movement to try to pull them out of it. And so I think there's a possibility that was a, a piece of it, right? Because, I mean, here's the thing with so many of these churches, what, what they're afraid of, um, they're afraid of I, at least two things. One is they're afraid of their reputation in the community at least in a certain segment of the community, which are very influential, right? We have, as I yeah. said, we have Southwestern University here, which is, I mean, think of any other liberal arts college in America, even in small town, Texas, just radically progressive. They co-sponsored the pride event. So if you were to go and to push back against it, then you're going to seal yourself off from having any kind of ministry activity with, with Southwestern. Um, oh. You know, all the city employees or the majority of them, the city manager. I mean, all of these people have an agenda. They're working that agenda. If you push back against them, you're you're going to be 
cut off. You're going to be put on the outside. Um, all the public events that they they put on, the Christmas stroll, on and on, right? You're going to be viewed as, as problematic and not given the privileges that other churches that are either in agreement with them or are silent on the matter will be given. So there's a cost to pay. Um, but even within their own congregation, they're, they're afraid that, you know, maybe half of the people that are worshiping here have become sympathetic to this ideology, have been, um, you know, persuaded by it. And they don't, you know, if you were to push back on it, they would have a problem with it and they would vote with their feet. So there's a lot to motivate them. There's a lot to lose um, by joining in and even just giving us a place to worship. Um, that's obviously viewed as too much, right? So we, you would, when you talk about going and evangelizing at the Pride event to talk people out of a movement, mm -hmm. you have a particular conception of Pride as not just what it's billed as. You see it as a cultural force. And I've covered this plenty on my channel, but I just want to yeah. understand how you look at it as something that's not just, I mean, the, the slanderous or low resolution pushback to you would be the preachers just preaching Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, kind of God's mm -hmm. wrath. Is your analysis, uh, does, is that what your analysis resolves down into, or do you see something else going on? Well, does it resolve down into that? I mean, that's, that's obviously a factor, right? If I think that someone's engaging in behavior that scripture says, or they are openly engaging in sinful behavior, that scripture plainly says will have eternal consequences, then certainly it's my obligation as a preacher, but also just as a Christian to share that information with that person and try to convince them that that kind of behavior, you know, leads to that level of destruction. So on, on one level, certainly um, the fact that God's wrath is pointed at those who engage in these kinds of sins is a huge motivator in, in going out and, and speaking to them, right? Which is not, I mean, you think of the hellfire and brimstone preacher, someone who hates people, right? He hates homosexuals. He's homophobic. He's transphobic, right? That I hate the people. If I hated them, I would stay home. If I, if I believe that they continue in that behavior and they will be destroyed, um, not only in, eternally, but also I think in this life, um, you know, I, if I hated them, I would stay home and I would just let them, you know, let the, let the end result be the end result. But instead, I go out and I try to talk to them and I face significant animosity, right? And, and uh, you know, sort of a rejection from a huge segment of our, our community because I am convinced that that is, that is the case. So now, having said that, to make that clear, that doesn't mean that cultural analysis just is just that, right? I mean, people are deceived by... Uh, vain philosophies, as Paul said. So what's captured them has to be understood so that it, it can be deconstructed, right? And they can uh, see the truth of Christianity. So evangelism is a complex sort of cultural engagement with, with people to try to deprogram them from this ideology that's captured their imagination so that you could turn them uh, to the truth, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about the culture and analyzing the culture so that when I talk to individuals, I can speak in a way I can put the gospel in context so that they, it can make sense to them, right? It's not just, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. Those might be categories at this point that they, they don't even understand. They can't relate to mm. at all. It seems so ridiculous in their mind. You know, Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of a hang Angry God, every high school student used to read that text. But I think it would be viewed as ridiculous to students today or to many of them. They would just laugh at it, right? When I read that text, it frightened me to my core because I yeah. had different presuppositions. It was a different culture, different cultural moment. 
Um, so evangelism is much more than just, you know, decrying that people need to repent of their sins. That's at the core of it. But to get to that point where they even sense the notion of guilt for sins, that they can even accept that kind of category can take a considerable amount of time. So people will see me engage in evangelism and they, they, I, I'll hear this. They're like, you're not even evangelizing them, right? You're just talking about the culture and you're making critiques of their particular social imaginary, right? So, you know, like, when are you going to get to the gospel? It's like, I will get to the gospel as soon as, you know, I'm trying to put the gospel in a context so that they will understand. So it will land, right? So they'll be convicted by the truth of it. And that can take, um, significant time, right? It's not just a one-off. I'm trying to establish maybe a relationship with someone so that we can, the conversation can continue, right? It's a, it's a it needs to be an ongoing uh, conversation. So. Hmm. You uh, mentioned uh, COVID and you were counterculture at that point and that uh, affected your congregation or uh, facilitated yeah. your, the growth of your con congregation what was your stance then and how is that based on your moral framework well the church that we wanted to launch uh, that we wanted to build was one that it's sort of like if you looked up in many of the uh, church planting manuals you're not going to see what we wanted to do right it's sort of the opposite of what you're told to do with all the high-end marketing and and really trying to figure out what, what, the, what kind of church the people in this area want and then give them that, right? And then meanwhile, you're trying to slide in the truth of the gospel at some point, hopefully, so that they can be converted. Uh, what we wanted to, to do was, you know, sort of this notion of word and sacrament, which is very traditional. But we wanted to present um, and create a community that was theologically robust or maybe thick, you'd want to say theologically thick in practice and in teaching. One that when you come in, to it would challenge you, right? The teaching challenges you. The, the liturgy itself challenges you. The, even the hymns that we sing are hundreds of years old, so they are dense in, in terms of their theology and thought, so they're deep and rich, and they've stood the test of time. Um, so it's, it's all about challenging, you know, the, the, the people uh, that, that come in, uh, both Christians and and non-Christians, rather than this sort of easy, smooth, you know, um, disburdening, maybe is a word uh, a word to describe it, where it's just like, I can just come in and relax and it's safe. Here's maybe another way to, to describe this. Have you heard of this idea of beauty, the beauty of the smooth, that in modern and, and, and postmodern culture, we've reduced beauty to the smooth. Have you heard that at all? Oh, no, I haven't heard that. It comes from a, a Korean-born German philosopher. His name, last name is Han. He writes these little booklets and puts them out, and they're, they're just so profound. One of them has to do with, it's called saving beauty or something like that. And in it, he argues that in the modern world, we've reduced the beautiful to the smooth. That if you read people like Plotinus or, you know, the the scriptures or, you know, throughout the Christian tradition, when they talk about the beautiful, it is something that, is dangerous, right? It's 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 not safe. It's something that is rough and confronts you, and it's not something that you can control, but it's something that overwhelms you, right? And all you can really do when you come into the presence of something beautiful is sort of surrender to it or run away, right? So beauty has that kind of strength and, and power, and what we've done in the modern world to control uh, the beautiful, it's this idea of trying to gain control over it, is we've reduced it to the smooth, we've roughed out, you know, you know, rubbed out all the rough uh, patches of it. We've made it so that, you know, when you come into the presence of it, it doesn't challenge you. It's easy. It doesn't require contemplation. It doesn't make, you might say, it doesn't require a contemplative distance. It's like, you know, the, the burning bush, right? You don't, it doesn't go up and touch the burning bush, right? You don't go to St. Peter's Bas Basilica, and stand before the La Pieta of Michelangelo and walk up and touch it, right? I mean, it's it's essentially like a sacred object because it actually is beautiful. And, and so it, it forces you to sort of maintain this distance, right? I mean, I guess they put glass up, but it, that would, 
I always thought, you know, the velvet ropes and all that, that's just for the most barbarian among us who are just the dope that just doesn't <laughs> get, you know, the achievement of it alone, right? But the beauty, when you come into the presence of it, because it, it connects us to the sacred, right? Um, and so, so much I think of, of, at least in evangelicalism, is just we've reduced it to the smooth, Right, to make it easy to disburden you, not to challenge you, not you don't have to think. You can just say, "Oh, wow, you know, I really like that rock and music or whatever." Uh, yeah. And we wanted to do the opposite of that. We wanted to say, "No, the beautiful actually challenges you." You know, take your shoes off; you're on holy ground. Um, and so here's the thing: is you know, part of that is to say that. We're very ecclesial centered, very church centered, meaning that our view is that church is absolutely essential coming together for public worship, the body of Christ. It's my understanding from scripture that that's the most important thing that a community can do. If you want revival, if you want to transform your community, the most important thing, the number one thing, there are other things you need to do, but the most important means for accomplishing that are when the body of believers believers come together and worship God. Okay. So for us, church is absolutely essential. So when we're watching the pandemic, we're going, this is not going to work, right? The idea that the, the, the liquor store and the strip club are essential and people are going there and all the other churches are essentially saying church isn't essential. You know, as long as we, you know, you serious about Zoom. the strip clubs, strip clubs were essential. I or is this it? Well, well sure. maybe okay. it's, yeah, I know. I know, but I, I know that liquor stores were. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but uh, maybe that was just in Texas. But um, so anyway, <laughs> what that did was this is why I say we would not have launched without the pandemic because no one cared about that. You know, like it's like the yeah. you know the transgender ideology. I've been talking about social justice for years, right? And no one cared. Right. As, as many other people who were speaking about it knew. Right. But in the church, they were like, blah, blah. You know, that's in California. You know, you know, it's, we can just ignore it. It's going to go away. It's so ridiculous. Um, but, you know, the George Floyd thing happens and then everybody's hitting me up, direct messaging me like, what is it you said about the social justice thing? <laughs> do, you, do you have those sermons recorded somewhere else so I can come in? You know, like, am I a racist? They're writing to me. I, I'm starting to think maybe I'm a racist. Um, huh. So it's the same. It's the same thing with this. Without the pandemic, right? I mean, you read the church manual. You don't want a church in the pandemic, right? Duh. When everybody's home. But without the pandemic, we we launch the church and no one cares, right? They're content. They don't see the difference. Okay. But when all the churches shut down, right? And yeah. we're opening, saying no, we actually have to be open. That's what that's what this church is about. Is that you know church is mandatory. We, we need to meet. It's essential. Church is essential. That immediately in people's mind made them realize the difference, right? So they could see the difference between what we were trying to do and what so many others were doing. And so that then permitted, and then people were coming, right? Then people were like, oh, okay, now this makes sense to me. I don't want to go back to my other church that, that doesn't think that church is essential. There's a, there's a, there's another trade-off here. I guess be between being welcome, which translates in this day and era, era to uh, being inclusive, to mm -hmm. trying to like you, you paint the, the Passover BLM poster on your church window and you put right. the rainbow there, Passover, like yeah. we we, inv yep. we we invite everybody. This this yeah. church, Christ is for all, or something like that. Which right. there's a truth there. Mm -hmm. There's usefulness there too, and then also saying that this is this is exclusive. This is exclusionary in the sense, like you you mentioned something about taking your shoes off, and and you said something about this is not e it shouldn't be easy, but it's mandatory. You have to do it, but it can't be easy. Like it's it's a uh, it's inviting, but it's not accessible almost. Yeah. Like, like what's the trade off here? Like you're, you're trying to, you're promoting a certain value that is in direct contention with not only consumerist philosophy, but like some sort of core truth about Jesus meeting people where they are. Yeah. So he meets them where they are, but he challenges them. Right. So okay. Zacchaeus, he, you know, essentially says what, what the end result is Zacchaeus goes and, you know, gives away his uh, much of his money that he's taken through extortion, right? He says to people, 
you know, your sins are forgiven, but go and sin no more. So there's a, and it, so, so Jesus will, if, if someone is, is broken, seeking truth, seeking God, right? He will come to them and meet them where they are, but he will challenge them all along the way, right? Paul says, you know, about people who engage in various forms of sin, such were some of you, as he writes to Christians, right? The, the such were some of you, such were as part of the gospel, which is you have to turn from these sins. He's not going to meet you where you are in the sense of just overlook, right? You're lost in your sin. Well, I'm just going to overlook that and you're forgiven and, you know, we can just move on and never talk about it again. Yeah. The, the end of the gospel is not just the forgiveness of your sins. It's not just Jesus saying you're forgiven. And okay, okay, now I have my ticket. I can go to heaven, right? The biblical view is it begins with that kind of justification because of what Christ has done on the cross. But then there's the whole resurrection bit that in much of evangelicalism we've forgotten, right? The, where, the, where the spirit comes in a new way, is poured out on Pentecost, and then goes and fills the believers and it you know comes to bring life to everything right to, to make all things new it's the gospel that's uh, sort of the you might say it's the it's the broadest way to explain the gospel that that's what the spirit is is doing so justification is not an end in itself it's it's a it's foundational it's the beginning but it's about transforming you into the image of Christ right? That's where the real liberty comes. It's not just freedom from the guilt of sin, but from the presence and the power of sin over you because you were enslaved to sin. So it's a liberation. The whole Exodus story is a, you know, is, the, is a description of that. It's a, it's a symbol of the, of the kind of liberation that comes from the spirit coming to live within you. So you can, you can enter in to that union with the spirit at any point you are, you just have to surrender yourself to Christ uh, and the spirit will come and live within you. But when the spirit comes to live within you, it's not going to be, he's not going to leave you alone. It's there to, to shape and to form you and to confront you uh, with all the areas in your life where there's weakness. To uh, Jesus is a uh, pretty cool guy. Like he always spoke in symbols. So I'm, I'm thinking um, you're rattling up all of the uh, Christian symbolism of Jesus going and taking a lamb out of like a fissure and then the lamb just runs back into the fissure like Jesus bringing like getting the shepherd bringing the lamb out of the stuck place yeah. is the forgiveness yeah. but the lamb needs to turn into a sheep and it, and then going back to what you were saying earlier the lamb turns into the sheep, so it doesn't make those mistakes, but then it turns into a goat and starts acting in a completely other way, you know, and then right. you still have to, we keep on running into these things. So it's the process of, yeah. it's a developmental process. That's right. So my job is not just evangelism to bring people into the kingdom, but it's then to teach them all that I've commanded, as Jesus says, which is the second part of the Great Commission. It's not just right. baptize them, turn them into Christians, but now you have to teach them everything that I've said. So it's okay. this, you know, it's this two-step process that I'm constantly working with people as they come into the kingdom or those who have been in the kingdom but have not been challenged or pushed before. And we do live in a unique time because when you push people, I mean, this has always been true because people are prideful. They don't want to be told where they are weak. But especially now, nobody gets to tell me, you know, who I am or what I'm going to be. I get to decide that for myself, right? I look at inside the warring desires of my heart and I determine what, which ones are authentic and I should express and blah, blah. Um, so that makes it even more difficult, right? You have to, you know, it's just a lot longer getting to the point of real repentance and acceptance for the person says, yeah, you're right. This is a weak area and I, yeah. and I want to do something about it and, and where they surrender to it. Well, th so again, there's the, there's the individual, the real work, that you're doing, but then there's also the public work that you're doing and the, the pushback from that. You said something about being the conscience of the state. How do you perform that in a society that's patently turned away from conscience, doesn't want conscience anymore? Well, it, it's costly. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, yeah. You know, especially in a community, right? So Georgetown's a little unique in that, you know, the, the people I, I would see 
My wife and I bought bought a property downtown, one of these things where you buy the worst house on the best lot and we're going to develop it, right? And so I was spending a lot of time with city employees, the, the city planners and all these people before the incident with the mural. And it was a marked difference of what we could accomplish and get done, how we were treated before, right? Before they knew who I was, I guess. And then after, after we became, you know, uh, uh, unclean. Uh, and it's it became the, almost impossible to get anything done. Yeah, it's it's another uh, inversion. Uh, you know, the, the people who are saying hate has no home here. Uh, don't right. can't recognize love anymore. I mean, I would, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm being very generous to you uh, because I know people and I haven't tested you on this, but there's different kinds of love and the love that is all accepting and all embracing is not the love that uh, is necessarily good over time. It might feel good in right. the moment, but it's not, it's not like actually long-term love. And so, uh, you know, the, it's that weird progressive inversion of all these, all these things that were founded on a deeper virtue have now uh, lost sight of that virtue and are now becoming the opposite. And now they're practicing exclusion. They're practicing, uh, I guess, some form of hate or uh, uh, mm -hmm. prejudice uh, at least oh, yeah. uh, against you because they see you as deserving of prejudice or promulgating prejudice. Right. Well, it's, you know, it's, and it's like mercy without justice. They want to get rid of the idea of justice. They just want to have mercy, but mercy is incoherent. I mean, mercy is the withholding of justice, right? I mean, it makes no sense. Uh -huh. um, it's, you know, it's like the hermeneutics of suspicion, right? This postmodern posture where the only truth is just the revelation that, you know, this particular thing of beauty is really ugly underneath. It's, you know, pulling back the curtain, there's a man working the, there's no wizard. See, just the, the moment of Aletheia or truth, it's just pulling back the curtain and seeing that's a cabal, right? It's just all conspiracy. Um, it can't all be conspiracy, right? You, you know, it, it, there has to be some true beauty in order for this to be a false version or this be a siren song leading you to destruction. So yeah, you're right. It's it's there's a deep incoherence um, with regards to to those issues, you know, of love, of mercy, of beauty. Um, but yeah, I don't. I mean, I just can't. I can't. If you're a parent, you know, what parent fully accepts their child in all the ways that they are as they grow up? I mean, you have an absolute monster yeah. on your hands, and. And to say, well, I, you know, I'm going to accept all those things anyway, I think is actually, it's a farce. You're not, the reason why you're allowing that behavior is not because you think it's not wrong and acceptable. You know, it's wrong. It will lead to them having a detrimental existence. The reason why you're not doing something is because you don't want to deal with the child pushing back against you. In other words, you're afraid of the child. You're, you're afraid that they will, you know, pull back from you or sever fellowship or whatever, become angry with you. And so it's really a posture of, of fear, which is a very distorted relationship with one's child. If you're, yeah. if you're, you know, if you have that kind of posture. So I think well, it's it, just it a is, lie. Not, not only do they become monsters, the child, but if the child is in control of the household, then the household just becomes chaos. The whole oh, yeah. thing becomes a wasted endeavor. And I'm sure that yeah. if you press the button of fast forward with your city, it'll turn into Portland. Like the, it, it will inevitably yeah. uh, be overrun with homeless drug addicts and, uh, you oh, know, and yeah. all the other attendant, uh, lovely yeah. uh, fruits <laughs> of that uh, beneficent spirit of yeah. progressivism. Yeah. What's well, the silver lining though? Like what, what do you get out of it? I'm sorry. Continue. I was going to say one thing I try to encourage Christians, part of the problem with the more conservative side of Protestantism is we haven't been involved in like city government, right? We don't think of statecraft as being worth our time. We have this sort of view that it's just for people who can't be entrepreneurs or, you know, are not successful. They're going to work for the government because they're all the bureaucracy and all this idea. And, you know, it's sort of like the more conservative Protestants who just have no sense of the importance of beauty and architecture and all these things, you know, that in sort of the anti-intellectual wing. But but I try to encourage people that, I mean, one of the most important jobs in a city 
in, in a community would be the, what we call the city planner, right? The person who is deciding what this space is going to look like that we all inhabit, right? Yeah. This, this, which becomes essentially a sacred space where we live. And it, it can be a space that, that, you know, turns our hearts toward holy ends, or it can be a space which deprives us, which, which treats us where we, where we feel less than human when we're in it, right? So it can either lead to flourishing or not. That's an incredibly important job. What an amazing job that would be to, to you know, to, especially if the knowledge is passed down generationally and how to create that kind of space. What a great job that would be. Um, but again, it's just that thing where it's like, we just are not involved. We don't want to do it. We're going to do our own thing, have our own career, you know, run, run our own business or whatever, because that's where all the value is placed. And so this, the rot just continues, you know, all the way through the, the city government and through the library, um, you know, the arts and culture community everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere well, that shapes I've... culture anywhere. Yeah. Well, is it is it not kind of the responsibility of some pastor, some minister to minister to those who get, end up in city government? I mean, I guess there's two ways to do it. Maybe it's entrepreneurs that are going to church because that was part of their value set and people who are bureaucrats don't have that value set anymore and aren't right. ministered to anymore or or this, that, or the other thing. I mean, um, and you can try to yeah. train people to go in there with your value set or you can see the value set of the people who end up taking those jobs and try to, I don't know. Well, it's totally, it was, I think it's so, a totally responsibility of the church in the sense that the church is the one that's, that helps to proclaim the vision, right? Uh, the eudynamic vision, the vision of the good life, the vision of the kingdom of God, you might say. So in a general sense, they're the keepers of that vision and they're to proclaim it. So Paul talks about in Ephesians 4, that essentially our job is to train ministers, those who go out and be the minister of, of um, you know, city planning, um, the city ministers to train them so that they see the vision, they see the end of where we need to go, right? And then they develop the skills and it's, again passed on generationally of how to get there, right? How to get the city, shape the city in such a way that it will be a place in which human flourishing can exist. And not only that, but where it will be promoted, right? Where the good is rewarded and evil is punished, which would be sort of the most basic way of thinking about what government is meant to do. So, yeah, I think absolutely that's a responsibility of the church. But in evangelicalism, we don't we don't ever talk about those things. We haven't for a long time. They were just assumed, I think, for a long time. Yeah. But also they were dominated by the more mainline Protestants. Mainline Protestants ruled America. They've been in all the places of leadership, right? And so it was Christian enough for the evangelical circles that I'm in. Um, but we didn't raise our children to, to say, you're going to become a Supreme Court justice. I mean, that's on the table, right? That's something you should, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's becoming so corrupted now that I'm not even, you know, sure that you would, one would recommend the educational <laughs> journey to get there would be so brutal that, um, so anyway, but, but yeah, we've, it's something that we've dropped the ball on, on the teaching side of it. And so we've just accepted what has come to us and we continue to accept it. Yeah. So where are, where are you and where is your ministry right now? And what are you looking at in 2024? Like, I guess you, you, you now are, you guess you're going on another exodus. You're just constantly yeah. Moses saying about town. Yeah. And would you, yeah. would you, if it was, if you, it was commanded of you, would you do this for 40 years? Just keep on moving. Just keep places going. I don't, well, you board. see how it, it, it grates on him. He's like, these people you've given me to shepherd. What? <laughs> I can't deal with them anymore. Um, I guess, as I said, as long as I feel the calling, I will do it. It's, it's, you know, it is rough, but um, yeah, we're, we are trying to find a new location. So I don't know. We're following some leads. This time around, I will say more people are inclined to at least consider it. Uh, last time, it was just an absolute no. Like we're not going to do it. Um, so we're praying for a church that will, you know, the use of a space that a church already has obviously is better, I think, than trying to rent some space. It's We have a better shot at, at, at a fellow church 
agreeing to let's use the space. So we're praying that there will be a church that will step forward that will be willing to partner with us in that way and, and be willing to stay the course. Because one of the things with the church is if you keep moving, it's very difficult to get any traction, right? Because you're, yeah, you know, yeah. this, it's, it's a total upheaval. So imagine if your family, if you moved every four or five months, it's hard to, you're not, you know, you, you just don't get locked in in a way that when you stay somewhere for several years. So we're praying that we yeah. can have a space where we can stay for an extended period of time that will weather whatever it is that's that that comes at us because i don't think you know the city's going to turn you know soon <laughs> back <laughs> in a direction that's that's healthy right i think we're i think it's going to keep getting worse we're, which would require our church to say more things which you know <laughs> requires more of a response from this community that that doesn't want to hear it so well, I mean, it's it's much bigger than just where you are. I mean, this is a, the soul of America is replicated on you know on a holographic level. Like you have everything within a nutshell within the grain of sand of Georgetown. You know, it's it's replicated uh, broad and wide. And as we see things develop and go this way or that way, I mean, I I don't have any projections, but I do know that that uh, degeneracy is easy. That the the, the People talk about, I was trying to formulate a sentence because I like trying to formulate sentences about like there's this slippery slope fallacy and it's only a fallacy when it's applied to everything going conservative, everything like reforming in the direction of virtue and everybody having to control themselves. Like all of a sudden we have fascist Christ, Christ. Christo fascism or Christian nationalism, like the this because one person resisted the slip towards degeneracy, it's just going to automatically lead to that. That's not right. the way that thing the cookie crumbles. The cookie right. crumbles, and entropy yeah. is the law of nature. Entropy is the law of right. of man. And I yeah. I've never been in a time personally where where reform has happened. I've been my the course of my life from 1976 to the present day has been one of degeneracy of, of mm -hmm. collapsing values and, and of the loosening of values. And I don't see it's going to change anytime soon, but I do see the writing on the wall of the, the ability for the chaos, the people who are possessed by chaos or the p people who are uh, on the side of entropy there, they are in control of the levers of power right now, but the law of entropy is that they can't actually, yeah maintain yeah. authority and and you see that right now with like the the states kind of positioning themselves against the federal government about this disorder on the border thing you know so it might have splash down effects we don't know how it's going to happen but regardless sorry to ramble regardless even if society snaps back so called in the other direction i'm sure that your christian values will will be to preach love if it goes in their direction too far justice like you'll start preaching sure. mercy if it starts swinging towards justice just yeah. as you're 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 preaching justice because it's going towards mercy we, yeah let me say something about that too because i came to faith i was converted at 33 so i was converted as an, an adult i grew up in a, in a catholic family although it was they're loving people but a nominal form of catholicism i went to catholics over 12 years and it was a bit, you know in the 70s and 80s it, there were many congregations in a weird place then, you know, a lot of 12 string acoustic guitar, weird sort of, yeah. you, know, you know, it's kind of a sort of a human, you know, secular humanism essentially is what I learned when I was all those years of schooling. Um, and so I just wandered away from it and became, you know, I didn't know if I was an atheist or agno agnostic. I didn't, atheist felt like I was making a truth claim. So I didn't feel like I had good enough arguments to argue for it. So I'd say I was an agnostic, just didn't know. And to a large extent for, for years, I didn't care. Um, but I go through, a, you know, a more radical conversion, but I'm converted into it, a, a very sectarian, legalistic church tradition. Um, and for about a year, it, I started to conform to it. I think my conversion was genuine because I was reading scripture for myself, right? Um, but uh, I started to conform to that kind of self-righteous, you know, the other extreme, you're talking about almost a fascist sort of approach. Um, 
which wasn't true of everyone that I was in fellowship with, right? But at least this is how I perceived it, okay? Um, and I started to conform to it and really become this sort of, uh, you know, Stalin-like figure. I mean, I was just, you know, my family and everything. I was just, just becoming this sort of yeah. uh, fascist. And and I thought, no, no, there's something wrong. I'm, I'm missing some, something here. And, you know, studying on my own or whatever. And I ended up believing that particular denomination, that particular group. But I spent, it was like I, I was converted. As I said, I felt a call to ministry. So I started doing ministry very early on. Uh, and got my first pastorate very early on, way too early uh, for the wisdom that I had gained at that point. I mean, we're talking three years. I'm three years ago. I'm an agnostic, and now I'm trying to shepherd people. It's insane. Um, yeah. But I, as soon as I came out of that mindset and realized, no, no, the you know the the balance between grace and works or, or, or um, severity. And yeah, the severity of it. Yeah. And so I, as soon as I came out of that, I spent probably six years trying to call everybody else out. So I wasn't that concerned with what was going on in the world because immediately, like the you know the matter of first importance was this church um, had gone astray, and I tried as hard as I could to preach in a way that would bring them back you know, to what I thought was the true gospel. So, um, and we had a bunch of success in that. And then I sort of turned my attention sort of to the other extreme. Do you know what I mean? So it was like when people think that when they learn of my ministry, they think I've spent, you know, 10, 15 years in this kind of public ministry, right? This kind of cultural critique on the outside and it's just not true. I mean, probably for eight years, seven or eight years in the beginning was all on the other side. So it's kind of like I went from one extreme trying to be a reformer. The only thing that ties it together is I was a reformer trying to be a reformer in both. I went from one extreme to the other. Um, so if you listen to my earlier sermons, you'd be like, these are weak. I mean, what are you trying? You know, because they, they don't realize the people I'm talking to. I'm trying to talk about grace constantly, you know, like uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and, yeah. and trying to pull people yeah. out of self-righteousness, which, by the way, the yeah. woke thing is its own form of legalism. So it's like it was the first thing that I noticed about it. I'm like, this is a different, there's just a different form of legalism. Um, so I feel pretty good about, yeah, my ability to I, I just have a bigger a broader view of it because i spent so much time dealing with the other i'm not i'm not this isn't you know the only thing that i focused upon and i might be blinded because of that yeah, yeah. uh what's the what's the role of christ in your conscience he's the lord of my conscience every thought taken captive to christ right as scripture says so yeah. It's, you know, it's strange. The, um, it, this is my experience, but what I often hear in my head are the preachers that have influenced me the most, right? With the voice I hear is the voice of a preacher that I listen to, you know, especially in my early days. Um, so I hear the voice of this preacher saying, that's your, that's off. That's wrong. You need to repent of that. Do what's right, you know? Uh, or even, you know, that's good. That's beautiful. So I'll often hear a preacher's voice, but it's a teaching of Christ. If you know what I mean, it's mediated yeah, to me okay. uh, yeah. through the voices of preachers that have have shaped me as a oh. Christian, shaped me as a minister. Um, yeah. And maybe that kind of mediation is essential, right? If, because the figure of Christ is one in which I don't have direct access. Well, I have direct access through the spirit, but not the human a part of Christ where I've sat at his feet and heard him preached, preach. Oh, you don't know. It might happen. Well, you mean, am I, 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 what I'm saying is it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying, you don't know. You, you might wake I'm, up one day with Christ, with Christ's voice in your head. Well, that's true. I don't, <laughs> that, that is true. Maybe that is my cessationist, uh, uh, <laughs> privilege speaking <laughs> influence there in fact most of those preachers that are in my voice are total cessationists they would what cessationist i need to i oh, need to understand there sorry the christianese right the um it's <laughs> meaning mean that the gifts of like tongues or have uh, ceased 
That's that, you know, that oh, sort yeah, yeah. of char- charismata is the gift, the charismatic gifts have ceased. Yeah. So the traditions I've always been in are the, uh, that they've, that those gifts have ceased. And so we're reticent. We're always, we're always saying, you know, I heard this, it wasn't audible, but yeah. God, you know, in prayer, <laughs> deep in prayer, I heard God say, it wasn't audible. Did I say it wasn't audible? It was not audible. So, um, so funny. Yeah. 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 So, uh, my own spiritual journey uh, from uh, I was to try to break down the voices in my head until I could have a direct, like, feeling of it. I just didn't want words there anymore. I like I didn't want it to be a lingual like word in my head, a thought based, mental, uh, programmatic, or propositional kind of spirituality. I didn't want a propositional spirituality. Um, but it, it's still the case that like I base my my uh, understanding of my own sin, let's say, or on interacting with somebody else. Uh, you know, like like I kind of feel like, okay, I did something wrong and it comes to light when I'm listening to somebody else or in relationship to somebody else or through my relationships with others is that. So I'm not like a per I'm not it's just interesting to hear that because I don't I don't like that voice in my head, uh, but every once in a while I'll have a dream where my dad comes to me. You know, the preacher dad part of me comes down yeah. and, and he like he'll he'll put something in front of me that I have to deal with. You know, and, and yeah. I'm like, okay, so it's just it's interesting just to kind of think about the conscience. You know, like and, and there's the Pinocchio. You know, like there's Jimmy Cricket. You know, like who is that that voice in your head? The the conscience is usually yeah. kind of described as a voice. Um, right. which is just kind of interesting on, on a psychological level. I'm like, uh, but it's ultimately my feelings that resonate. It's like, okay, yeah, I, I distance myself some somehow from the holy. And and it's the voice that helps me to see that, or it's my, it's, it is a mental process or there is some sort of propositional act, interaction between my feeling and, and, and then my thinking in a way. Right. To make it How does it, let conscious. me ask you this uh, about that is what is it that, how do you, what's the means by which you actively shape those feelings, right? Those affections, what kind, yeah. do you have certain practices that you do that, cause you know, like you said, yeah. there's a, there can be an intellectual side to it, right? Where you can hear arguments and you can look at something very didactic, propositional, and you can learn, you know, you can gain knowledge that can shape you some, but liturgy and practices shape you in such an immediate yeah kind of way are there you know do you pray do you uh, i don't want me to get yeah, personal if you yeah. don't want to answer those no 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 I, I i kind of avoid talking about it on my channel because like I'm, I'm supposed to be like above and beyond any given topic you know not really have my own kind of uh skin in the game but yeah i, I have a, a spiritual right. practice that is uh a direct immediate uh i think from a christian point of view you would call it charismatic but being in charismatic christian venues it's not it doesn't have that same uh emotion driven or like it's not as intense it's a very light direct all i can describe it as like when i was growing up in the church every once in a while the services would kind of recede away and i would have some sort of direct connection to this light love thing mm-hmm. i can't describe it in words but it's like the the power of god just like the power of god would just be there and like i would be face to face or with the power of god and and so i found through my um explorations the, a practice that allows me to interact with that and that was and finding that uh initiated like this relaxation around a lot of my rebellion against the aesthetics of the churches that i grew up in you know like i just had an aesthetic revulsion to that that turned into a ethical uh rebellion but i can't live my life in rebellion because that destroys me so i had to find a way to 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 go back uh to get connected to that direct experience and then uh kind of overcome my aesthetic problems with it and then uh and then find the beauty again in in the Christian tradition. 
Yeah. Which I well, think is, it ideally yeah. would be Catholic, but every time I go to a Catholic church, there's always something off unless I'm in Europe. Then I'm like, okay, this is where I belong. Like this, this yeah. is the space that I belong in. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, that's interesting that uh, it started with the aesthetic and then went to the moral, right? Because the, the, the Christian tradition that I came to faith in, I'm still in evangelicalism, which is doesn't really deal much with the aesthetic. Well, it has an aesthetic, but it's, it w- wouldn't be high church <laughs> by any stretch. Um, but it's interesting that you go for that because the church I came to faith in had, it was in the influence by the Puritans. It really had this idea that the uglier the church building, essentially the more holy you were, right? Or at least the really? plainer, the plainer yeah. it was. So there was a the constant smoother. fear, the smoother. Yeah. The, there's a constant fear that we would worship the building somehow. If it was, had any appeal, it was appealing at all. There was a danger yeah. that we would worship the temptation. The building. Yeah. Yeah, like that temptation to just, we cut that off, you know. Before. It's like having a beautiful wife. Like, I don't want a beautiful wife. I want an ugly wife. Because what if I, I love her beauty? <laughs> what? Instead of her, yeah, instead of her, for this, yeah, the, the beauty of her her soul. No, yeah, it's, so that, that, that can, I can totally see how that can lead over time. When you rebel against that, you, you, can, you, can, you can then lead into rebellion that, of the moral part of it. But that is so interesting because I, I often try to focus upon the aesthetic part of it, right? That making beauty primary in terms of not only evangelism of coming into the kingdom, yeah. Uh, yeah. but uh, but even, you know, my teaching for those who are looking to grow in their sanctification, beauty, uh, just from, I mean, that's that's anthropology. It's who we are, right? We, we are beings first and foremost, love, right? It's not beings who think or beings who know, but uh, there's a, our affections, our, we delight is in control. There's a, you sent me a link to one of your sermons and uh, you were in a guitar shop. Now I understand why there's guitars all, all around yeah, or whatever. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, a lot of these church such guys. such a bizarre, guitar, yeah, you know? I know. I know. It's a, somebody, somebody has said that it's, it's hard, the message is being counteracted. So many of my sermons <laughs> are being counteracted by the environment because I. Yeah. It looks like I'm in someone's basement or garage or something. It's, it's like just, Wayne's it's, World preacher. It's like Wayne's World. That's exactly what it is. That's a great way to say it. I'm like preaching in Wayne's World's basement, uh. <laughs> and and it's like you can't. You doesn't matter what I say. All of this behind me is communicating something yeah. so powerfully and loud. That's yeah. that it's disconnected to, to everything that I'm saying. So it's, I need to switch to audio for all those sermons. I'm going to need to switch them to yeah. audio, I guess, to send people because it's so distracting. When I, well, but, but well, like that, that's the funny part. But when I listen to the sound of your voice and whenever I'm like researching uh, one of my guests, like I get, end up just, I just need to hear the sound of their voice if they're ready to speak into a microphone, like if they're ready to be where I want to go, which isn't like any sort of intellectual environment. First and foremost is grounded on the aesthetic of the experience, like this calm conversation. It's a pun. It's this clever little thing, but it's actually like, that's the aesthetic that guides everything else. And the aesthetic, like when I listened to you and then uh, like I had, I had a Jonathan Peugeot uh, on a few weeks ago and he showed up. I was in a terribly, uh, nervous state because of what was going on in my life. And when I showed up and sp- spoke with him, like the first 10 seconds, I just heard how calm he was. I'm like, oh, he prayed today and I didn't pray today. Like I could feel like, like that, that connection, the depth, yeah. the quietude, you know, the fruits of the spirit Yeah, and the fruits of the spirit are, I think they're tonal, um, at least the spirit from, from my, from my limited point of view like they're tonal so they they're like the uh like they're that which come before and after the message right they're they're the they're that which shape the room and then leave a a vibration in the room and so you know like listening to your voice like and then listening to your story it's like there's 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 not a contradiction between what you preach and what you practice as and like how you actually behave um and then if you look at wokeness 
Like they preach one thing and then you see like how they behave and you're like, oh, this is include, this is what you mean by inclusion and peace and harmony. Like what, what I hear is shrill. What I see is disgust and disgusting. Like, and what I smell is disgusting. Like everything you're actually like manifesting is the opposite of what you're preaching. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The aesthetic is it, it's, it's, there's a primacy to beauty. Well, in, in I don't, I think this is a sermon I sent to you, but um, one place where I have this conversation with people, it, especially now, there seems to be a lot of people who are either returning to Christianity, the faith of their youth, or coming upon it for the first time, given all the craziness that's going on, sort of their, their kind of liberal political views that sustain them and they, you know, it's had enough residual Christianity or whatever in, in the culture to give them enough meaning um that's all collapsing around them and so they really are seeking right uh genuinely seeking and what i what i've found is so many of them stand at the threshold of the kingdom and they are like it's like they're waiting for reason to push them in right they're waiting for it to be compelled to come in through reason and they're shocked when i tell them well you're gonna you'll be standing there for the rest of your life it's never going to do that right? It's, it's, there's a leap that has to take place. You're going to have to make a jump into the threshold or you're going to, I guess it's the language often uses a leap, but rather being pushed by reason, what you have, what you're going to be doing, what's happening is you're being pulled by beauty, right? But it's a risk, right? There's a hesitancy there. There's a risk because beauty can deceive, yeah. Right, you can be deceived by beauty. Beauty can terrify it. too, like you were saying earlier. It also it's like puts you at a distance. You have to surrender. You have to. It's a complete surrender. So I, I, I refer to it as it's not a leap in the dark. And people will mock that and like, oh, it's irrational. You've got to embrace something that's irrational. It's a leap of delight. But it is trusting. You have to trust the testimony of other people. I mean, you don't know what it's like to be a Christian until you become one. We're talking about the spirit coming inside of you and transforming your soul and changing you. You don't know what that's like, no matter how I try to describe it to you. The best I can do is give you kind of a secondhand knowledge where you can feel some of it, but you can't feel it completely until uh, the spirit comes to live within you. It's the, I think I said in the sermon, there's a, a philosopher, uh, Lori Paul, who describes it as becoming a vampire, which is kind of a provocative way to say it. But you don't know yeah. what it's like to become a vampire until you become one, right? There's a there's a major transition that happens, and maybe your friends test who are vampires testify to how great it is. They'd never go back, but they're vampires now. They're not even human anymore. Can you really <laughs> trust them, right? It's like there's this moment of trust and a taking of a risk and a total surrender that happens. This leap of delight that's essential in in order to um, enter into the kingdom. And and now the, and then of course there's confirmatory signs and wonders once you're in the kingdom as you move forward and say okay this is true, uh, yeah. but I can't I've experienced this but I can't I can only explain yeah. them to someone else until you experience it yourself you you really can't know, and so beauty yeah. is there's a primacy to beauty and that's not just true about converting to Christianity by the way it's true with regards to any kind of consequential decision that you're going to make. Because you're never going to be able to reason it all the way down to certainty. It just it, it's an impossibility. There's there's always a risk. Um, and you know, in being a vampire, once you're a vampire, you can't go back. In some Christian traditions, the same is true of Christianity, right? Once you become a Christian, you won't ever want to go back. So it's a one-shot deal. Um yeah. so yeah, I, I think that's like you said, think of that compared to the shrill, right? Like there, what is the beauty that's drawing them towards that particular worldview, right? That system. What is yeah, this vision then. of yeah. the good life, you know, yeah. or, or even just the Marx vision of, you know, the utopic vision was always so vague. It's like, it's not really about that. It's, it's about the suspicion, you know, the deconstructing oh. and destroying what comes before. That's the sole focus, which makes, which is really appealing well, there's a dis there there's a, there are groups that are not part of this, but but you know at least many of the leaders are just driven by resentment, right? They just want to destroy the thing that has come before them that's rejected them, they think, and they you know it's sort of it's almost kind of a murderous rage of destroying destroying the culture that's come before. 
Well, I mean, even Jesus came with a sword sometimes, right? He did. Don't tell <laughs> pastors that, but you know, <laughs> he did. He came to divide, right? If in all yeah. your preaching, you're not dividing anyone, you're not preaching, at least not like Jesus. Again, that's the challenging part. You're there to wow. challenge people, to push them. And they're not going to like yeah. it. And they they kick against the goads and they're like, oh, you shouldn't talk to me like that. And, uh, you know, and then next week they'll come back and, you know, they'll be like, okay, you're right. I thought about it all week. And <laughs> you're right. Okay, fine. You yeah. know, it sounds like an argument not between me and my wife both ways. <laughs> like we yeah. both end up admitting the other. Okay, you're right. Yeah. And that's what it is, too. That's a real relationship. You're in it together for good. Right. You're saying, you know, this is it. We're going to stay together. We're not going to dump the other person as soon as it gets difficult. But you're going to have to deal with me. I'm going to have to deal with you. In fact, there is some yeah. uh, some way to think about in, in Genesis, this idea of the help meet as sort of this person that you rub against. Right. That's that is there to challenge you and you are there to challenge them. So, you know, the the. Uh, you know, said so that so you can be refined, right? Iron sharpens iron, kind of yeah. thing taking place. But that's a real relationship. Like the church should be a real relationship where we push back on each other, and they push back on the pastor. You say, Pastor, yeah. what you did right there, that's wrong. And as a pastor, I have to be willing to say, you know what, you're right, and get up in front of everybody and say, I was saying this and doing this, it was wrong, and you know, I repent of that. I ask for your forgiveness. And it's amazing when you do that, everybody's like, okay, well, I, they forget it. They move on, they're done, right? They only hold a grudge when you don't, you know, admit it, right? And and, yeah. and say, okay, and I'm going to try to do better. Um, but that's the essence of a real relationship. And, and as I said, our inner narcissist doesn't want to deal with that. It's difficult. And, you know, yeah. if we could manage it, we'd live alone. We'd live yeah. in ice, total isolation. Yeah, little golems running around looking for our ring. Yeah. Oh. So I guess you refuse the calling of the great internet. You're not going to do a podcast. Or do you post your sermons somewhere for people to listen to? I do. We have a YouTube channel. Okay. Um, where we, and part of the reason to do that, I'm, and they're, they obviously post them so that people will listen to them, but also it's part of it is just a catalog, all the stuff that's come before so I can point people to it. Like, okay, I've already talked about that. Here's the thing you can go listen to. Um, so yeah, we have a YouTube channel. Um, I mean, during the pandemic and all that, we ran into all kinds of trouble. We, we had all these, I had all the videos originally on Facebook. And of course, all that got shut down because we were talking about all this stuff we're not supposed to be talking about and no and no it. doubt we are just we are just completely shadow banned oh my god youtube too if you don't I love type in our, our techno, name exactly right techno <laughs> fascist world that we are and yeah i just love it it's just amazing yeah. they're yeah, the ones who want to save us the, from democracy you know if meant if this was the public square where you went down to the public square you started speaking your mind and these overlords would come and in you know and put a fence around the grass well they did it to you man yeah that's true they did <laughs> that's true imagine yeah. that imagine they would do something like that for <laughs> sure yeah i guess they did so huh. yep that's where we are and uh, so what's what's your church name? And if people are in Georgetown, when do you guys meet? Uh, and I guess you don't know. It's like it's open book right there. Yeah, oh. it's called The Church on the Square. So uh, we do have a website, but usually people uh, get updates and all that on Facebook. So you can find us on Facebook, also Twitter, which is actually my Twitter account. I don't understand Twitter or X, but I guess it's like Brad Helgerson one or something. Okay, um, I'll, I'll send a link at there. Twitter. Yeah. But yeah, so we just... We don't know where we're going to be at. We're, we have till the end of February to move out of the place we're at. So we have a month. Oh, okay. Well, there we that was very Christian so. of them to give you some lead time. <laughs> the uh, person who called me, the representative said, hey, at least we're not the palace. Essentially, something like that, because we're giving you <laughs> two months to move out. Like, I guess, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So I'm not sure. I don't know where we're going to land. But, you know, they'll... If you're in Georgetown, you can find us. I mean, yeah. you know, but when we find a place, we'll we'll make sure that on all of our social media, we'll put it out there where we're located and when we're meeting. And uh, 
So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much for the discourse this morning, uh, Reverend. And uh, you have a, uh, is there a, a apostle or, or a theologian who particularly uh, you keep on returning to? And you can say Jesus, but I'm looking for, you know. Yeah, I guess if I go from Jesus to the Apostle Paul, it's very, as a Protestant, obviously, it's very influential. Um, the character in the Bible that I feel most akin to at the moment would be Stephen, right? Obviously, the, the bold preaching of Stephen, which he's preaching to his brothers, uh, his kinsmen in the flesh. Um, huh. And they did not receive it well, uh, but he still... He spoke boldly. So, um, you know, and I guess Isaiah, I mean, this makes me sound like such a, um, it's part of the reason why I don't do interviews. It makes, me, it makes me sound like such a, you know, like, oh, well, unlike Stephen or, you know, like I, the great prophet Isaiah, who they saw it in too, you know, this is, this is who I am like, but. Um, or don't you, do, don't you ever yeah, feel but, like the what it was Elijah or Elijah or Elisha or whatever who uh called sick the bears on the boys? Do you ever feel like that? Sick Elisha, the yeah. Bears? yeah, I I you know I do wish I had that skill. <laughs> I wish I had that kind of power at times, but it's likely good that I'm not. Because you know, uh James and John, Jesus calls them the sons of thunder. It's weird that uh John is yeah. always painted in these you know, in the Renaissance paintings is this sort of very effeminate, you know, this sort of seraphic stare thing. And Jesus called them the sons of thunder. At one point, they, the Samaritans wouldn't let them pass through. And, it, and they said, do you want us to call down, you know, fire upon them from heaven, you know, and destroy them? And Jesus like, you don't know the spirit <laughs> that you were of. So I'm, I, my natural spirit is much more like it's not your temperament. Like okay. theirs. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, <laughs> it's good that I don't have such powers, such, yeah. such commands. Yeah. So. Uh, there probably wouldn't be a Georgetown left, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There may not be a okay. city government. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Well, it's all good. It's all good fun and good faith. Thank you so much, Pastor. For your, thank for your you. Days. I Excellent. really appreciate the conversation. Uh -huh. I enjoyed it much. So thank you, sir. Great.